everyone and welcome to day one of the New Blood Digital Festival 2022. My name is Marie and I'm Foundation Manager at DNAD. This year's festival gives our audience access to a range of opportunities, including three expert talks, portfolio opportunities made possible by advanced website creation platform EditorX, including our exciting new portfolio competition um, and also a live and in-person portfolio surgeries with over 500 spaces, an exclusive opportunity to network online with uh, the app Anyone, the phone book of the future, and an exhibition of over 30 university courses that you can explore right here on the festival page that you are already on. So to kick off today's festival, we are very excited to introduce our very first talk, which is Working with Influencers, Get the Low Down. For this session, you'll be hearing from our panel of experts. We have Chloe Downs, who is founder and head of talent at Shift. Jessica Cheng, who is creative lead at Digital Fairy. Leila Fatar, who is the founder of Platform 13. Uh, and then Ramsey Mutran, who is founder and chief creative officer at Do Epic Shift. Led by today's absolutely brilliant host, Fab Giovanetti, who is founder and head teacher at Alt Marketing School. So to hear um, how you will be experiencing the session, you will be hearing all about making the most of utilising influencer marketing, common pitfalls and exciting insights on where this world will be going next. You will see as part of the session, there is a chat box at the side of this talk. Please do use this to let us know your thoughts and share your questions, which we'll be sure to leave time for at the end. And that's it for me for now. I will now hand over to the wonderful Fab. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. Welcome, team. I'm very excited and honored to start and kick off the day. And uh, we have loads of questions that we're going to cover. For sake of ease for the panel, we're going to go through each question and I'm going to ask one member of the panel to answer and then everybody else will be able to share their thoughts if they want to add anything to it. As the wonderful Marie said, we'll keep an eye out for your questions, so please start dropping them and at the end we'll have some time for those as well. If you have a question for a specific panelist, please do let us know as you're asking the question. It will make uh, life a bit easier as well when it comes to asking those. But we're going to start with probably one of my favorite questions because it's one of the, the cornerstones of the, of the starting point of thinking about influencer marketing and influencers and creators. So I'm going to start by asking Chloe and then obviously if anybody else wants to add. But first and foremost, how do you define an influencer or content creator? And I would love to hear also your thoughts about the words, because I think semantics are really important and the perception of them also can has changed the thing over the years. So Chloe, I'll leave it to you. And then obviously afterwards, we'll kick off a bit of a debate as well. Yeah, hundred percent. So hi everyone, my name is Chloe, as um, I've been very kindly introduced. I'm the founder and head of talent at Shift. Uh, we're a talent management agency, so we manage a bunch of amazing content creators. And then that kind of leads me on to the answers to the question anyway. We generally talk about our kind of creators as content creators or as talent. We rarely use the word influencer. And I think unfortunately that's just because I'm not sure if other people will agree with me, but I think there's certain connotations now that come alongside the term influencer that maybe doesn't really reflect on the kind of people that we, we represent. I think influencers become a little bit of a dirty word just because of how it's kind of been used in mainstream media and by people who maybe don't really understand this industry. I think content creator is way more aligned with the kind of people that we work with, people that really are creators. They're creative, they're creating content, they're putting it out there. Um, whereas influencer, I think, has kind of been a bit diluted and the word influencer is thrown around so much that really we've lost the meaning of the, the kind of word behind it where it is influence people that have an influence so personally i prefer content creator but i, I do hope that we can start reclaiming the term influencer again someday hopefully i love that how is anybody else feeling about that where the influencers versus content creator which ones would you use and we use them both, or how do you agree with Chloe? Leila, go on. Um, hi, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Um, I think I totally agree with Chloe. Um, that word for me, actually, when I started Platform 13, uh, my big strap line was rest in peace influencer marketing, actually, uh, because I come from quite old, come from the old school. Um, I worked in fashion and culture and sneakers and this world, youth world, for a long, long time. Um, and actually, for us, 
um, influential people have always been people who add value to the community. They are the ones who have the voice of the community um, that you're trying to be part of. Creativity for us comes out of that cultural resonance. Um, and we call them cultural voices, actually. Um, and they can content create. They may not even be online. Uh, they're influential in their community and in their culture that they that they work on. So for instance, when I was working at Alijaz, it was sneakerhead culture, for, for example. Even that word as well has been killed. So we don't even use that one, but it's still this idea of influence in the truest sense. What comes out of that can be multiple things. Some of it could be content, some of it just could be insights. Some of it could be activations, whatever. Um, but for me, the word influencer is a bit of a dirty word. I actually find it quite hard to say, uh, just because I feel like it's become like social in, social uh, media endorsement of products. Um, and for me, that doesn't necessarily feel influential. It's, there's a role for it, but it feels more like advertising. Um, so I think reclaiming the word influencer, uh, Chloe, feels like a lovely, lovely, lovely thing. Um, I wish we could, and I wish we could get to an industry standard of the spectrum of type of people who are influential and their roles and what they need to be there to do probably as an industry standard would be would be a good way to do that. I absolutely love that. And obviously, if anybody else wants to, Aramze, see you got your hand up as well. But I love the idea of using influencer marketing has this sort of umbrella that can have the different types of influences. And we use some words like community, cultural voices already, which I love as well as content creator. So we'll see if a few words more come up. Ramsey, well, what were you thinking? I love what you both mentioned so far. No, it's, it's actually more of a personal story. Um, I was asking my daughter, who's now 19, uh, what she wanted to be. This is a couple of years ago. Um, and she says, I wanted to be an influencer when I grew up. And I was like, I was actually quite shocked being in the industry thinking, and then I asked her the very simple question, influencer for what, of what? And I think this has become the biggest challenge on my side is if you're an influencer, great. Influencers have been around uh, forever since the time of actors and endorsers and everything, but there's an influencer that you influence in a certain particular manner or way. What value do you add? And if you are simply there just as a broadcaster, yeah. I think the classic sense of influences now is seen like a media term to amplify a message versus content create. So I'd actually, I don't actually see influencer as a bad term. I just see it as another category of advertising where you just amplify something that someone else has created. Whereas the place that we all want to play in and enjoy more is the content creators or the people who add value to a relationship between a Quran. And that is where I think the difference and differentiation is coming. One is amplification, simply like a billboard or a TV commercial. That's it. You just give it to them. They broadcast it. You're buying the likes, you're buying the views, you're buying the eyeballs. The other one is adding value to the relationship between the brand or the, the, and the consumer or the, or the actual creative entity. That's really interesting, actually, given the shift of perception between the two. And I think, as you say, kind of placing different elements. I mean, obviously, we asked all of you. So, Jess, I'm not waiting for here mm -hmm. what you think and what you find is your thoughts after all of this. But this is a kind of a great kickoff. So, Jess, tell us more. Um, I think these terms are used quite interchangeably a lot of times, but people do throw around the word influencer. It does seem like um, a bit of a dirty word and as someone who I'm like a creative lead at the digital fairy but I also do create content myself on the side and I know that like my friends who are also content creators notice I use the word content creator we would never we would never introduce ourselves as influencers just because of like the negative connotations but I think there is like a slight difference be between the word influencer and content creator I feel like people engage with influencers because of their um, like online persona, like maybe they have like a certain lifestyle that people like, maybe they give advice around a certain topic. Um, I feel like their content is usually more kind of like lo-fi, quick snaps like in the moment and it's more kind of real. Whereas I think content creators curate like a certain like look and feel to their content. Um, there's like a level of artistry in their work and it's more about like an aesthetic too. So I think oftentimes people will hire content creators or brands could hire content creators to create content that feels um, native to so different social platforms, for example. That's actually a great way to kind of kick off with the next question, which I feel a bit like this one. Thank you so much, everyone. It might be that everybody has an example for this one. We're going to start again with one person. But all I wanted to say is, if you're watching and listening, please keep this in mind, because 
or what our panelists mentioned, it's so important. And you will see how different connotations and also the different words that we use that we answer the question, they might change depending on the type of, I, I use the word creator first and foremost, for example, from a personal choice, the different types of creators, what they're trying to do and who they are. So I think it's really interesting to kick off with this. Jess, I'm coming back to you straight away uh, with the next question. And obviously anybody else, if has some examples afterwards, please let us know. But personally, do you have any examples of campaigns that you think nail or nailed utilizes influencers or creators for some of their creative works? Uh, yes, I do. So um, this example, I feel like his recent silence on the real strikes makes him lose a few points. But uh, Francis Bourgeois in the Gucci and North Face campaign, I thought was really um, iconic. I feel like it's like a perfect example of a successful collaboration between an influencer and a brand. Um, so clearly, like Gucci designed this campaign with Francis Bourgeois in mind alone. And for those of you who guys, of you guys who don't know him, he's um, a TikToker who's recently just blown up because he just goes and does like train spotting um, around England. Um, but they dressed him up in Gucci. They shot him in their usual dreamy kind of whimsical style. And it really worked. And I think this is a really great, uh, great case study that proves the point that you don't have to make TikTok references or you don't have to have like feature influencers like holding a phone and filming themselves to make it feel like authentic. I love that. Any more examples or campaigns, TikToks or otherwise? Just give me a little hand up and we'll get to the next one. The one Oh yeah, we got Chloe first, <laughs> and then Ramsey. <laughs> it's like, oh, who's faster? Chloe, well, welcome up for you. Um, yeah, no, the, the first thing that came to mind when I read this question was a very recent campaign. I think it was only a couple of weeks ago it came out um, by Victor Kunda. Um, if, you're not rec if you're not familiar with him, he's a TikTok content creator. He does a lot of kind of comedy sketches, quite authentic, kind of real feeling stuff. Um, but he's recently done a campaign with Samsung. And I think what Samsung did really well with this campaign is that they it from from an outsider perspective anyway it looks like they really just allowed him to have creative freedom and it was very very much in his style if you were scrolling through it kind of spree or feed and you came across it it just felt like any other video that he would create it didn't feel too addy it didn't feel too kind of like focused on the product it was very funny so i think i think what they did well there was they just allowed the creator to be creative which i think something is, that's is something that's so key with campaigns in general so i think that would be my example Wonderful. Ramsey first, and then we'll finish up with Layla. Ramsey, what did you come up with? I always find the best way to use influencers is in a bit more of a reactive manner than a proactive manner sometimes, because they're often talking about lots of brands and lots of content already. And if you're, if the brand is a good, good at listening, they can react and engage in things live. And EOS did a great one with bless my, and forgive my language, and bless my fucking cooch, where they created and recreated a brand because of this woman's um, TikTok recommending a product that she was using in a very unexpected manner. It actually won really well in DNAD this year. It, I thought it was incredibly brave of the brand to go and endorse this content creator's interpretation of the product and actually recreate and submit and, and, and recreate the product for her. And then it became so popular, they actually made it for the mass. So I think that's a very clever way in a reactive manner to use, uh, use the space. So my, 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 my examples are slightly different. Um, two of our projects actually, um, one was for Guinness um, around Carnival last year. Guinness has been sold to um, the Afro-Caribbean um, uh, area since the 1820s. So it's absolutely embedded in the culture. Um, we did a collaboration with Original Flavor, who are two brothers who cook Caribbean food, um, have a book, fantastic, really, really well thought of um, in the culture. Um, we wanted to do a collaboration with them around Carnival weekend, which was under, under lockdown and so wasn't happening. Um, and so we did quite a long um, activation with them where we created um, a series of recipes uh, by their nan, showing them how to use Guinness in their sort of traditional jerk chicken, Guinness punch, um, which is one of my favorites. Um, and actually we did a citywide takeover poster campaign showcasing and highlighting their nan. 
um, which was really incredible and was so well received by the community. That is a cultural voice for us. It spread like wildfire. Rest in peace, she passed away afterwards, but that's one of their proudest moments was their nan up on posters with my husband loves his Guinness punch as part of the, one of Guinness's first campaigns um, with people of colour and also in community around the time of Carnival. So that was one, I, one, one example of using influence, uh, perhaps maybe differently. And then um, another example was YouTube. We did a recent media literacy program for them, a 10 part series, but actually we identified people who were um, influential, had lived experience of the topics around online abuse, um, conspiracy theories, all of this, and we had them hosted by Munya Chihuahua, who we all love and we know is very clever and satire, as well as Amelia de Moldenberg. So again, just trying to make sure that we're identifying the right people within their style to deliver information to the community and to audiences in their style, but actually wrapped around um, in, in, in meaningful um, communications, if you want to call it that. So hopefully that's a bit of a different twist because it's not necessarily online, but worked and moved online uh, just through influence. Um, so hopefully that just gives another idea to the audience uh, that we're talking to. These are all excellent examples. And I love that you all brought up different excellent ways to actually make campaigns really impactful. We have native content, the importance of native content, even leaving creative freedom to uh, the creators, reactive campaigns, and we even mentioned pers personal and cultural connections as well. And obviously one of my favorite things, I'm gonna lift Chloe's words, is allow allowing creators to be creative, which I think it's so important. And it, I think it wraps around everything in that you all said in different ways, which I think is really powerful. So thank you so much. Leila, I'm gonna come back to you now again. <laughs> um, when do you think people or brands miss the mark when it comes to campaigns or examples that you might have had in mind? Uh, where they miss the mark? I mean, Pepsi and Kendall. I don't know what else to say. Um, I don't know if everyone remembers that killer, killer campaign. Uh, but for me, that was a perfect example of going, who's really famous influencer? What are the top 10 topics that we need to talk about? Let's put them together. Um, so for me, that is the one that still, I know it's a few years now, but still still feels quite, um, quite, quite live for me um, because that was really bad use of someone who's got absolutely no connection to police brutality. <laughs> um, and um, the topic that they were trying to cover with Pepsi just felt really strange um, for, for, for them. So that's the one that really stands out for me still today. Anybody else has any examples of actual campaigns or maybe even some practices that you've seen, maybe some brands do or they still kind of pursue despite kind of some of the better judgments these days? Oh, Ramsey person then, Chloe. <laughs> Chloe beat you to it this time. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think for me, it's very, very simple. Anyone, any brand that's simply not using relevance and using, using their, how many people they've up the followers they've got as a judgment to partner with them. Simple as that relevance is the key to any sort of great content nowadays. Um, and any brand that's using its numbers and the numbers of views they have or followers they have is, is the ones who are missing the mark immediately. And that's the Kendall Pepsi example completely. Um, so yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Can I jump in? Perfect. Um, yeah, no, I think just, just echoing both of these guys' um, answers, I think firstly, I think also trying to be too relevant. I suppose it's kind of a mix of both of yours, trying to be too relevant, but actually not having the people on your team to do relevance properly. Um, I think that just goes back to the lack of diversity in marketing generally. And I think you can see that quite obviously with a lot of campaigns where it's quite obvious that no one from that specific subsection of the, the community was actually sitting at the table making the decisions. Um, it's very clear quite, <laughs> quite often. Um, and I've definitely got a lot of briefs through for my creators where I can, that, that I actually had to go back to a um, agency recently and just say, actually, I'm not sure if you're, you've realized, but the brief you sent me through is actually racist. So you might want to go back and, and rethink what you what you sent me. Um, but I think kind of going back to my other point, 
something that a lot of brands do that really miss the mark is sending a, a very prescriptive brief to talent kind of either sending scripts, sending kind of point by point marks of what they need to do. And again, just taking the creativity out out of the campaign. I think if you want to do a really prescriptive brief, then better just to hire some models and create an advert yourself rather than going to influencers or content creators. It, it doesn't make any sense why you'd pay someone who's who's built that platform and built that audience. Yeah, and not and not allow them to have that creativity that they kind of their audience clearly love. So I think prescriptive briefs is something that people need to just stop doing immediately. <laughs> yes, did you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I definitely like echo the sentiment of what everyone else is saying. But yeah, brands definitely need to see beyond the numbers and look at influencers as creatives and collaborative partners in achieving a common goal. And they are real people who have built their following on projecting a personal brand. So they must align with your brand campaign and vision for it to feel like authentic and real. Um, and also you need to choose influencers that stand for something like they specialize in something or they have a point of view, like what is their USP? So I think that's the most important thing for sure. I just want to underline Chloe's uh, example of briefing and actually having worked both in-house at massive global heavyweights and had um, my own company and how started Platform 13 is actually to address that, Chloe. So every single brief that we get in, we curate the team according to the category culture and community it's part of. And that was a really, really important, important part of why we are. We've got a small core team. Every single brief that comes in, we have parts of the community and culture built in to be able to make sure that resonance is there and that respectable and mutual beneficial thing is there. So. I love that you brought that up. It's something that's uh, one of the things that I wake up in the morning about and trying to change. So yeah, let's get it. <laughs> love that. Love that. More, more, people, yeah. more people need to work like you guys. That's amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. More people need to bring it up like you. So yeah, nice one. I think it's really change important as well. We do it all the time. <laughs> It's going to be the, the final words of, of, but you know what? Thinking about everything yeah, exactly, that you all the final words. You know, and everything that you okay. mentioned can actually be brought back to the brief. You know, if you can think about this oh. as you're building the brief, you can really build something that is special and unique that people can get back to. And I think it's also really out of respect of the creators or influencers that they're going to be then taking part of the campaign because it sets their expectations. And also, as you all said, it gives them the freedom to bring their personality and their selves into the brief as well, which I love. So thank you so much, everyone. Again, these are excellent notes just from that. And the next question that I have, it kind of piggybacks on this and kind of follows up on this, because I think the brief is one of the first kickoffs when it comes to problems that can arise between brands and that dynamic between the brands and the influencers. But I'm sure there might be a few more. So I'm going to start with Ramsey this time. I wanted to know what are some of the common problems that can arise between brands and influencers when it comes to the dynamic of the relationships? And maybe if you can think of one or two, what can we do to avoid them? Let's give people also some proactive uh, tips so that they can avoid them. I think challenges can, can be, when people have a great following, it's because they usually have a strong opinion or a nice opinion or something they believe in. Um, and the challenge with brands is if that doesn't quite match the brand's values um, and the brand's vision. And that can often cross over and cause challenges for on a corporate level, on a business level or for the influencer being not true to themselves. And they can actually destroy that platform because they are doing something that they obviously do not believe in. Um, and I think authenticity and relevance is the key to any influencer or anyone who wants to create any great following or be a leader in any sort of manner. So the first thing is, if you are gonna to commit to partnering with an influencer content creator, make sure they are aligned with your brand values and do proper checks. Don't follow the numbers, follow the personality. Like the ladies were saying earlier, give them a good brief, give them a really clear brief that gives them the freedom to go and do something that, that is relevant to themselves. Don't dictate to them what to do because it's gonna come back and bite you and hurt your brand or hurt their following. I think the third thing is just give it time. Don't rush it. Very often it's so rushed and so quick and they want it immediately. People don't have a chance to do something authentic. Um, so those are the three tips. I love it. if there's anybody else that has some other problems or things when it comes to dynamics or relationships. 
I kind of feel like I got the pressure of choosing who goes first, but it doesn't matter. Layla first, but Layla and Chloe, well, so you've always been. Let me go ahead, please. <laughs> thank mm -hmm. you, thank you. I feel like. We're, we're all in this together, it's all good. No, I just want to um, come back on that point, actually, with, with the kind of doing research stuff. Obviously, I'm, I'm on the kind of talent side rather than the, the brand side. And honestly, the amount of campaigns that come through to some of my talent, and I honestly have to look at some of these brands and think, have you even bothered to look at their page? We've got some of our talent who are kind of activists in the kind of climate justice space, and you've got huge brands that have, have a lot of backlash about climate, <laughs> climate stuff coming to them and asking them to work with them or I don't know LGBTQ plus talent that we have and brands that have been pulled up for um, kind of saying stuff in that space you know people need to do more research but I think generally in terms of working with talent my biggest advice would be to actually get to know talent and how they work what we have a lot of is kind of brands coming to us or agencies coming to us and it's quite clear that they're not really thinking about the time the energy the effort the expertise that goes into creating this content and they'll kind of ask for things that are quite unfair come back with a load of amends without thinking about the fact that it's going to take them another week to to kind of film it or coming with really short turnaround times things like that just stuff that's quite unreasonable sometimes so i think my advice would be to actually get influencers to come in, sit in, have conversations with your team, talk about how they like to work, um, talk about best practices when working with creators, um, talking about their process. And hopefully that will just make the whole relationship moving forward with, with any creator a lot easier. So I think in a nutshell, just getting to know creators process more will just make everything easier, I think. And just to add to both of those, so just backing up both of what they're saying, but also adding from a brand point of view, really understanding the six, what, what success looks like. Because with big brands, the traditional measurement is very much media. So they go, it needs to match a media buy, but of course it's a completely different like channel if you want to call it that. And, you know, to the point of Ram, Ramsey around relevance and authenticity and Chloe as well around process and understanding and actually working, collaborating with the actual talent versus giving a brief with an expectation of eyeballs, but to the point of a media buy is really crazy. There isn't an industry standard on measurement of success. That's a massive problem because that's where the clash comes in. What's successful for the talent is not necessarily successful for the brand because they're looking at the objectives differently. So there needs, there's a mismatch there in what does success look like for both of them. And that needs to be aligned very, very early on. Very early on. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, can I just jump in quickly on that? I think, I think being clear with your aims is really key. I, I, I completely agree with you. I think quite often we get briefs, but it's not clear as to what they want is it yeah. that you want clicks is it that you want incredible content that you can yeah. reuse is it that you want views like what what is it that you actually want because that also changes it? how yeah. you create the content as well so yeah, yeah no i can completely yeah. completely agree with you yeah just just to change the brief that. <laughs> <laughs> Mila will shout every so often just to remind us i yeah. like it we, got it we know what to do sorry just go ahead go ahead no worries um, I think to find influencers that resonate with brand voice, uh, obviously, like as we're all saying, the process all starts with a brief um, from the client or brand. And it's just really important to kind of agree on what the objective of the campaign is, um, like maybe like what age category you're trying to like, they're, they're trying to target, what sort of niche of influencer they're looking for. Like maybe they're looking for someone in like, the luxury fashion market, or maybe they're looking for like a Gen Z gamer, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes there are KPIs attached to, to measure the success of a campaign, whether that be like reach, link, link clicks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so coming from like an agency, working for an agency, um, the agency would use their expertise, expert experience and knowledge of what's going on to find a perfect roster of influencers that will fulfill that brief. Um, I think a good agency will also like attach a casting strategy and rationale for each influencer to kind of prove to the brand that this is why we've chosen like who we've chosen. Um, I think a good agency will also ensure that they present a roster that is diverse in race, gender, sexual orientation, body type, et cetera, et cetera. I love that because I think there's a lot of power in remembering that regardless of who you are, as you are watching and tuning in, the importance of understanding that if you are unsure and you are from a brand perspective or even from a creator perspective, the importance of understanding and being aware of the fact that there has to be objectives. You want to make sure that they are clear. 
nurturing relationships. And I think sometimes we underestimate the work that lovely agencies and obviously brands like yourselves have to do to actually keep educating and kind of guiding and iterating the brands and the, and the, and the talent itself to actually make those changes. So again, chapeau, as they say, hats off to all of you because it's, it's a lot of work. And I think without that, then also brands need to be educated or guided sometimes to understand what type of success they're really looking for, what they think they should be looking for, but actually what they can get out of these relationships. So I love all of these. And again, remember to change the brief, uh, just putting it out there. Uh, but thank you everyone. Now, Ramsey, I'm gonna do a flip off and start from you again, and then we're gonna go back. Um, because something happened early this year, and I wanna start with your opinion on this one. And so early this year, Agavi actually, uh, what they did, they would said they would no longer be working with influencers who retouched their photographs. In case you didn't know this, this happened earlier this year. So this is a very, very important and very interesting kind of change and development. So I wanted to ask you all, but starting with Ramsey, where does this responsibility of representation sit? And what are your thoughts on this? Because I think it really sparked up really interesting conversations and I would love to hear all of your opinions but again we'll start off with you I think the topic you could talk about the topic for for an entire talk by itself in terms of body image and and the, the challenges social media is causing on that overall the fact that Ogilvy decided to to do this I think was in one way brilliant I think it's nice however in another way it's also it's blaming the wrong thing. I don't think the Photoshop or retouching is the problem. Um, it's actually, I think, a lot deeper than that in terms of the body image that brands generally portray. And I don't think blaming Photoshop, because let's face it, half the times the apps have these natural Photoshop abilities anyway. The filters are in there. It's you. I think you're, they're, they're focusing it on the wrong part of the problem. I also think it's a lot to do with their, one of their biggest brands, which is Dove and based on the campaign they just did. So I think it was a bit of a PR thing on the back of the Dove campaign they just did, which is based on retouching. So the brand, and Olga basically can't take on competitive brands like that. So I think it's great. It's not Ogilvy's responsibility. It should be a WPP, or it even should be a something even higher than that. But fundamentally, it's actually the social media platforms that should be managing this far better because it is a much bigger topic with a much bigger um, challenges that need to be addressed on a government and a legislation level, not on a single agency's level. Yeah. If anybody um, else has any experience. Yeah. Go on, Jess. I totally agree. So I feel like making a sweeping claim like this seems to be shaking the finger at influencers and making it seem like an influencer born problem. Um, but this will should be applied to all platforms and media that they work with. Uh, so like men in advertising have long dictated beauty standards through heavy retouching and image man manipulation, but like making a claim like this now without directly um, addressing and owning up to contributing and perpetuating beauty standards is honestly like a little bit offensive. And then to penalize influencers who are mostly female who have been conditioned to meet these standards is simply just not cool and it's a little bit misogynistic. My question is, are, are they going to stop retouching all their billboards? Or anything else they're doing, I don't think so. You know, I think they've gone and I think yeah, you've nailed it. They're blaming the wrong people. I think Olivia covered this really well. Um, it's great to get a headline. Both of the opinions here, I totally agree with. And for me, there's not much more to add. Both sides really, really relevant. Um, I do feel like it, it's a it's a nice headline. I love that. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone. And. I love also the different points and it reminds us of the perspective of actually what can be done. And I think especially having these conversations and they remind us that as Ramsey said, this can be taken at a higher level and actually create the standards and the understanding so that we all have, I know I keep banging on about education and maybe it's because of what I do, but I think it's so important without the understanding and knowing that there are better ways than it's hard sometimes, especially for younger creators and influencers that just come to the space that guidance can really help them, especially if they do want to pursue a life or a career as this type of talent. And talking about talent, uh, Leila, 
I think this is a really interesting question because it can be so different depending also how you work as an agency or even as a brand. But I would love to hear the process of sources influencers. For example, obviously utilizing agencies, which I know some of us might be like, well, that's what we do, but also, you know, the process of reaching out personally, you know, how do you find influencers that resonate with the brand's voice? maybe from an agency level, but also how can you do that personally as well? I would love to hear some examples just to help the, our audience to kind of look at this. So I've got weird experience, right? So I had a 10 year communications company before I went in-house to Adidas and Diageo. Um, I have a huge network myself, just being old, been around, <laughs> been doing lots of things, right? So already have a fantastic, strong global network of people. Um, they themselves have networks of people. So everything we do here, Platform 13, uh, when I was at Adidas, when I was at Diageo, and even at my first company, Spin, was all through relationships. Um, and that's literally how we find people still today. So now we'll maybe put a call out now, but usually we get a response from friends or friends or friends. As I said, for us influencers, there are, there's a spectrum. Um, usually for the ones that are more on the advertising side, we don't really have those kind of relationships that we might go through um, a contact, a casting person, uh, but we don't generally, we don't generally we usually have relationships that we call out for or friends who can introduce us. So it's slightly different for us um, like that. I don't think that answers the question. It just, I guess, just comes from being old and, and having known lots of people. I don't know. <laughs> I do love that though, to be honest. I think, so thank you so much for sharing that because I think it's also important to remember that from a personal or again, also like an agency perspective, when you do have a wider network, it creates a different dynamic and especially if you are starting out with as a small brand to do it yourself then you almost feel like it's impossible but then you need to remember the perspective is like what is the current existing network so anybody else maybe they can add something also from an agency level if you don't have a bigger network or if you're starting out they move from scratch yes Leila first and, she and, just and, 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 yeah and sorry just to add on to that as I was <laughs> telling you the way we work is we curate the team those people mm. usually are really connected as well. So just to bring that in as to how we, we find people we work with. Yeah. I love that. Uh, Jess and then Ramsey as well. Jess, what, what were you going to add? Um, so I work for a creative agency called the, the Digital Fairy, and we're known to be internet and youth culture specialists. And we have a division called Fairy Networks that does the casting and connects brands to influencers. So as a brand, I guess if you're approaching, you can go either route of approaching influencers directly or using an agency. But often brands are like resource poor or they don't have the insight that an agency that specializes in influencer casting or management would. Um, also speaking like as someone who does content creation on the side, um, I get sent emails and briefs all the time. And oftentimes like that whole relationship building aspect just isn't there. Like a, a lot of my friends that also do this, like they just feel like a number or they feel like, you know, you're being reached out to because you're just taking a diversity box. So I think having like meetings and really building that relationship is super important from the beginning to get a good outcome. Agreed. Ramsey. I think for me, it's more just, again, what I was saying earlier, the thing about sourcing or getting good talent is people that are relevant to your brand. Um, and they should they should come to the top of the pile quite naturally by doing a little bit of research but also by by briefing properly briefing on the cause not on the reach or not on the size people who believe in the same thing and that's what you've got to look at the way i look at it mostly is what value can they bring to the the spectrum don't look at winters like a media platform look at them like a content creator look at them like what value are they going to bring to the creative process and bring them on board to the creative process earlier i mean before you crack the idea bring them on board let them be part of the process that is the best way to get the most out of them i love that and it's kind of funny because um i have a question that we kind of answered but i'm going to add a bit more to it because i would like to see a couple more ideas you already mentioned it right now ramsey but also jess you mentioned it too that sometimes we focus still i'm going to say because my background is in influencer marketing even if i don't do it anymore so it still is on followers and likes for some brands or in some briefs, in some communications. 
so I'm going to rephrase slightly the original question because we kind of mentioned that that is not all that we should look for when we're reaching out. But we talked about culture also. We talked about obviously different elements, values came up as well. Can you think, I'm going to ask Jess first, but then anybody else as well. Can you think of anything else that we should be looking for when we are doing this outreach for let's say a specific brief and maybe we're trying to find new and fresher talent to connect with outside of our network? Um, so I think that, again, you need to see influencers as not just a marketing partner, but like a, a creator and someone with their own ideas. And again, someone who's built their following on projecting a personal brand. Um, and they should really be like aligning your brand camp. They should really be like aligned to your brand campaign, um, and vision. And so maybe back in the day, it was more about numbers, but now it's more advantageous to spread like your influencers spread spend over a range of influencers from macro to micro to really make sure you're kind of like hitting um a wide a wide audience and really targeting like a, a large reach hopefully that answers your question <laughs> it does it does that's excellent i don't know if anybody else has also anything else to add even if as i said we kind of like mentioned it throughout i think if you could hear like culture and values but i don't know if there was anything else that came up especially from that first initial uh, outreach I think, I think I think just adding to the values piece and I think just backing up with what, what Ramsey is saying like whatever product you're working on there's going to be someone out there who is really 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 engaged is an expert in whatever the topic and subject might be like that person can be online or that person can be offline um, and it's connecting with that person because even if it's not that particular person, they will know other people as well. So I think I think it is about that research and making sure that you're looking in the right places. Uh, because if it's about climate, there are definitely people who are climate orientated. But again, very easy to go for the easy sell. We talk about at the moment sustainability being quite wide, but actually Indigenous and POC have been doing it for a long, long time, but they never really get the voices out there, yeah? So look wider and deeper in your research for really where the roots of stuff are. That's much more interesting than just the person who's the same person over and over again, talking about the same thing over and over again. So I think um, that's how we work. We're quite, we're quite weighty in what we do. We're quite considered in what we do uh, because we want to make sure that we also get other stories out, other points of views, other perspectives out that because the internet's wild and got so much information, how do you uncover the untold stories? Um, and that's where maybe diversity also comes in as a, as a really big part of that as well, because there are definitely marginalized voices. Go for them. Uh, if you're searching for new stories, please. <laughs> yeah. I absolutely love that. Thank you so much. And it all puts actually into perspective the importance of going a bit deeper and actually taking your time with the research. Sometimes I find you can, and there's a question that the audience asks that is very similar to this, you know, we kind of rush through what we think are the things that we should look for, but when we go deeper, untold stories is definitely something that really kind of stood out for me because storytelling is really what connects, uh, connects us with yeah. people. And I think that's really what, where the content creators shine by telling their own story as they share their expertise or unique outset and outlook in life. And I'm going to go a bit off piece because it's time for questions. We have one more minute from the audience questions, but I'm going to jump in straight away because I'm a rebel today. I feel it. But also, I promise, is relevant uh, because this question from the audience, so thank you so much for asking, I think it kind of works really well with what we just talked about because we talked about success and defining success beyond some of the KPIs or the metrics that we suppose are the ones we should be looking for. So the question is, how do you measure success as some micro influencers aren't going to get to the eyeballs you're anticipating? So maybe, maybe can we think about some practical KPIs or some specific KPIs that we can look for? I'm going to throw one in there, such as audience sentiment, for example, that maybe not everybody knows about, but they could be really interesting for us to look at, especially when working with smaller influencers or creators. I'm going to maybe say Chloe, just to finish off this round, but obviously everybody else can then jump in as well and keep it a bit more light for the last 15 minutes. But I don't know if anybody else has some ideas, but Chloe, I'll start with you. 
Yeah, of course. So obviously I come from the talent side. So from kind of like an agency brand perspective, I'm not sure exactly what these brands are asking for. But from a talent side, I think what my frustration is, is that not enough people look at the kind of value of comments. And I think that when you look at the kind of smaller creators, you can really see that value in their comments where it's not just the love struck eyes. It's not just the fire emojis. It's not all of that business. It's actual comments like don't know i love your trousers like i'm gonna go and get them now or oh i actually bought this hair product because you recommended it to me or whatever it is and actually in my opinion those are way more valuable than a like it's very easy to like a picture it can be done while you're mindlessly scrolling whereas the kind of comments the the active engagement in dms afterwards messaging saying oh yeah like this is i'm tagging you because i've now bought this product those are the things that are more valuable in my mind anyway and i don't think enough brands and agencies look at that or even ask for that information did you get any dms after we did this campaign have you got any reshares from this campaign I, I don't think people are looking at those kind of real human aspects they're more looking at the kind of vanity metrics of, of likes and views yeah i totally agree we actually call those soft metrics um and we always have them in our in our information we have hard metrics how long how many people watched your videos whatever um but for instance with uh, never settle we did a big campaign for uh, rugby for guinness again just like around equality in rugby um and also with the carnival one uh, with original flavor and nan um the comments were unbelievable the dms we had comments like guinness have finally realized that they sell to black people that powerful right this was huge for the community and comments like this is a historical moment that's the stuff that makes me get really really excited but of course and, and of course makes guinness really excited because they're like wow that means so much more so i really like the idea of again the measurement success standards and what is successful or what's not it's a huge issue it's a game changer actually on how we work with talent influence whoever is the measurement standard that needs to be across the board so there isn't the expectation of 50 million eyeballs but actually the comments the soft metrics really really start to balance out um exactly why you're doing it differently to advertising so really like that yeah yeah on, exactly i think it's um you said it beautifully because it's i know lo lots of you guys are on the talent side but i'm agency side right i've been agency my whole life and there's two very different schools of thought. There's the media agency approach, which is simply eyeballs, another version of a TVC, and it's actually cheaper than a TVC. So they just use it as a yeah. broadcast. But I also work a lot with TikTok, and TikTok is changing the way content is created, changing the, the whole world. And, and my brother actually used to work there. So I've got a lot of insights, and their entire platform is based on relevance. And if 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 they really want to go and create a true connection people don't care if it's an ad or not if it's relevant to them they will are happy for influencers to go and do great content for commercial benefits if it's relevant and it's all about that relevance that has to be the only metric that matters in my opinion because otherwise it damages the brand it damages the influencers content and it it it, it ruins the relationships if it's relevant if it's something that's authentic then it's then it's the only metric that matters in my opinion but that's but that's and i think i think that's absolutely right but what is that metric i think that's where we need to get to because it's all good but it's one of those nebulous terms that people just use and justify right but actually we need to get to a something somehow if the hard plus soft equals relevance i don't know whatever but that's for me the biggest blocker at the moment of this entire sort of channel to be fair I'm a creative. I don't do equations very well. I'm, I'm really, really bad. At it. I'm very emotional. Yeah, I'm very emotional in terms of my choices. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's quite simple. It's, it's if, if that person would love to drive that car or actually wants to drive that car, then it's, it connects. If it doesn't suit, then they shouldn't be associated with it at all. In terms of the and metrics, that's fair enough, the but, science. And that, kind of, yeah. And that's fair enough, but as we all know, with big brands, it's like scale obsession, right? How do you get that one person times one billion is what they're going to ask for, which, you know, <laughs> is the problem. So the yeah, scale only, obsession uh, with, with, with media uh, um, agencies. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, no, I, I, think, Sorry, I feel yeah. like I was I was lagging a little bit. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> no, I think with, with relevance, I do feel like relevance comes down to comments, though, because I think... Um, I can't remember who someone yeah. used Munya as an example earlier. If you look at Munya Chihuahua, when you look at his comments, 
his yeah all of his comments are talking about the whole relevance of his content when he does the kind of yeah. very quick responses to things his comments are just reflective of the how relevant that? his content yeah. is right now at this time and i think i think generally i completely agree with you like we need to make sure that campaigns are relevant and to be honest that's on both sides i think influencers shouldn't be taking yeah. on campaigns when they don't like the product or they don't believe in the product people need to stop taking on campaigns people need to start saying no to yes. things but i think to actually measure relevance goes back to the comments and the engagement with the content yeah. you can see in the comments when people hate things and they're like why on earth have you done this i'm sure the comments on pepsi's post was wild so i think you can yeah i think to to sit down and write a comment means that people have really felt something totally so you agree. can go to the comments to look at like how people and, feel i think and the, the education to more the important. brand to understand that that is where they need to be looking it's not we i think we all agree but i think the brands need to be educated on why that's more important than the number of likes that they see. It's that education upwards um, bit. And that's where the industry standard of measurement needs to happen so that everyone believes it because someone needs to create it and then everyone uses it. So, uh, you know, and that's something that agencies need to work with with their clients uh, to be able to push that, to be honest. So it's going to take a village, but I think we need to get to comments being fantastic. That would be a great place for measurement. Uh, but the brand sometimes probably don't look at it that way, unfortunately. I love that Ramsey also mentioned shares. I see that you threw it in there and I think it's so important and it all goes back to that. Because <laughs> it's, it's important and as you say, it's all about the relevance and the sentiment. And I just want to add my quick five cents to this from a small brand perspective, working with a lot of students and also like smaller brands. Especially, I think a smaller brands really appreciate the value of comments, especially when collaborating with creators, because I want to talk about maybe the elephant in the room, which is some of the negative, but almost constructive comments and what they can actually teach you as a brand about your product oh. is invaluable customer feedback uh, that you can yeah. actually get from seeing that. And I see the brands that actually then take the time to respond to those comments from the creators post and kind of support that customer and also learn from them is so powerful. So I, I genuinely love that. And actually, I'm going to piggyback on this. I'll open to everybody. So we're getting good at, at kind of debating here because there's a great question that comes from the audience related to this. Do you think TikTok has changed the game with comments as they turn into all's most separate community added to the content? So uh, comments turn into a separate community added to the content. So do you feel that TikTok is the one that's changed the game? And how do you see that going when it comes to shaping campaigns and content from a creator side? TikTok's ruling it simply because they they changed the game and to say you can't put your content here. You've got to create TikToks to be relevant on TikTok, and I think that transformed and gave power to the content creators. Whereas the other platforms were far easier for brands just to go and create a post and reshare it. It doesn't work on TikTok, and that's what's so lovely about the platform. Um, I think uh, I've noticed when people first started moving from Instagram to TikTok. Uh, the algorithm was just so different on TikTok and on Instagram, you kind of have this community that you've built from scratch and they kind of already know you and they know the kind of content and they, they already like you, which is why they're following you. But on TikTok, when you post a video, it just gets thrown out to the wild to anyone. And I think it was a shock for a lot of um, Instagram content creators in the beginning because sometimes they get like a lot of really harsh like hate comments that, you know, on their outfits or, you know, on their skincare routine, for example, that they just weren't expecting. But I think it's a really great thing. And there's just so much insight that you can draw from comments. And it's even a popular TikTok format now for people to piggyback off a comment and answer a question and create that into new comment, um, into, into a new video and new, new content. So um, I think it's a really nice way of just kind of like growing your community in and, and interacting with it. I love this. I'm going to ask one more question, like a quick one just to finish off. Because it goes back to this, so we're kind of, I love what we're mentioning here about TikTok and also Ramsey mentioned uh, create TikToks, which is something that I heard from a, a colleague who actually works for TikTok. So this is really interesting because I believe it's easier on TikTok, but other platforms still struggle. And uh, the question is, how do the panel feel about the audience turning off much more easily as soon as they see some sponsor content? So any tips on how to avoid audience missing? 
Oh. Um, so yeah, any tips on how to avoid the audiences getting dismissive when they see ad or sponsor content? I would love to hear just as a final question, if there's any ideas on how we can help there or if we've seen that changing a bit as well. Chloe, you want to jump in I straight? Going back to the, yeah, of course. I think going back to the point that I've made about 25 times, <laughs> like stop making such, such um, prescriptive, that was a hard word to say, prescriptive briefs. Wow. Um, I think I've had so many briefs come through kind of specifically from for TikTok where brands want their logo within the first like second, three seconds, five seconds, whatever it may be of the ads. And I have to tell them it doesn't work. You need to see someone's face. You need to see the person for the first few seconds and then you can kind of naturally integrate the brand in. It can't be, the thing is it doesn't work on Instagram, but it doesn't work even more so on TikTok when people are kind of blatantly holding brands, pointing at brands all of those kinds of things, it needs to feel more organic. Exactly what we're talking about is kind of a more community-based platform. Um, it's a more real and raw platform. I think that's why people really enjoy it. So I think you'll stop people turning off from your ad if you make it feel less like an ad and you make it feel more kind of natural to the creator's work that you're kind of collaborating with, I would say. Just create a big shit. That's it. It's, it's the simplest way, whether it's an ad, not an ad, just do something that's brilliant and then people will like it. It's that simple. I mean, people share ads all the time. I love the last the big Nike ads that come out every so often. People love that stuff. And if it's just good, it'll be shared. If it's, pardon my French, crap, they will not. That's it. <laughs> Make good shit. <laughs> You go for it. I feel like we, we always, always just have thoughts at the same time. I know. I know. I was just saying, I was just, I was just shouting on Ramsey for the plug for his agency, but yeah, I like it. <laughs> that, that's what led to the name of the agency. Back I know. I know. Trend, go ahead, Chloe. <laughs> All right, it's true. I haven't used the word shift yet. I need to, I need to try to integrate know, that somewhere. Come on, um, come on you missed it. You're missing a trick. Yeah. I know, I know. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, it's completely gone out of my head now. I can't, I can't remember, to be honest. Sorry. <laughs> well, you've got your name above you, so you've done your, you've done your, you've done your, your due diligence. Fine. Yeah, exactly. Anyway. I see Marie coming up. We're, we're all wrapping up now. But thank you. I want to say from my side, thank you so much, everyone, for being so lovely and for sharing so much. And I really hope that the audience took out so much out of it, as well as create an epic shit, which I think is one of my faves. But I think there are so many little nuggets that I hope we have given you today. So thank you so much. Thank you so much to the panelists. I'm going to do my little clap.